I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. This is Rendering Unconscious 150th episode, so I wanted to give a big thank you for all of our listeners and all of our patrons for supporting Rendering Unconscious podcast. Thank you so much for being here. My guest today is Dr. Tim Themey who holds a PhD in philosophy and psychoanalysis from Deakin University. He teaches in the School of Culture and Communication at the University of Melbourne and is the author of Lacan's Ethics and Nietzsche's Critique of Platonism. His newest book is Eroticizing Aesthetics in the Real with Bataille and Lacan. He's holding an event on his new book, Eroticizing Aesthetics in the Real with Bataille and Lacan, via the Lacan Circle of Australia, this Sunday, August 8th, in conversation with Russell Grigg. The event is free and open to everyone, so visit the Lacan Circle of Australia's website at lacancircle.com.au for more information. That's L-A-C-A-N-C-I-R-C-L-E dot com dot A-U. There you can also find information on his upcoming seminar on perversion, which begins on August 17th and runs once a week for 10 weeks. The Lacan Circle of Australia offers all sorts of events, reading groups, study groups, and Lacanian cartels. You can check out all they have to offer on their website. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode and on the Rendering Unconscious website, renderingunconscious.org. Coming up in October, I have an event with Tim Themey, which will be called Cast Off and also involves Marcus Boone and David Bard Schwartz were hosted by Frank Ansel in Paris, and that will be on Saturday, October 9th. We've all written about psychoanalysis, specifically Lacanian psychoanalysis and the arts, and we'll be presenting our work together there. To stay abreast of all events, you can sign up for my newsletter at drvanessasinclair.net contact page. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. That's V-A-N-E-S-S-A 23 C-A-R-L. Your support is so appreciated. Thank you so much to all of our Patreon patrons. So, where would you like to begin? Uh, Well... As we were saying just a moment ago, you, you, you were saying you, you yourself like to normally begin with uh, how, how one got into, how one became interested in psychoanalysis. So I, could, I guess I could talk about that where um, my own sort of uh, pathway to it came through, uh, I guess it came through philosophy uh, after, which was a second degree I did after I went and studied uh, engineering a sort of science-based degree, worked for a year, I was kind of horrified by the, by the kind of a uh, corporate mentality. It was the, you know, neoliberal sort of era of, uh, of Australia. 
the, the, the treatment of the environment. You know, when you're a chemical engineer, you're supposed to be applying science to solve these pollution problems, not, you know, fudging the, the facts to help, you know, big business interests continue it and make money off it. You know, just the effect on me. And it just, just, you know, just I think it was the confrontation with nihilism, like there's, there's something wrong, really wrong with the world. What, what's going on there? And to me, this seemed like a philosophical question. And so I, I went and did a philosophy major. I'd already been a reader of Nietzsche beforehand um, and, uh, and a musician beforehand. So I had some sort of access to the arts. Um, and from there in philosophy, I guess, uh, liking Nietzsche, I was sort of gravitated towards certain, certain figures. Um, and Freud was one that was taught in amongst, uh, amongst Nietzsche, along with the sort of French figures that, um, that sort of came along as well in the 20th century. So by the end of my, uh, by the end of my uh, bachelor degree and when I started my honours, um, people like Nietzsche and Heidegger were, were very important, but I was in a sort of a reading group with, with, the, um, with the professor and a few uh, postgrad students. And um, psychoanalysis was there too. Like my professor was a, 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 um, a Heideggerian, but also a, also a Jungian. And one of my colleagues uh, there in the group was uh, interested in Heidegger, but was also a Lacanian at one of the three major schools here in Melbourne. And myself felt interested in Heidegger, but also having a background in, in science and Nietzsche, I was also interested in, uh, in Freud. Um, so the sort of the three of us were kind of like a bit of a trio in mixing philosophy and psychoanalysis. And that eventually uh, led to me uh, going across from La Trobe University to Deakin University, where I met uh, Russell Grigg, who you might be familiar with as uh, one of the translators of Lacan Seminar. Um, himself, who, who was supervised by uh, Jacques-Alain Miller. And um, we ended up doing a, um, a PhD on Lacan and Nietzsche, on Lacan's ethics and Nietzsche's critique of Platonism, and that turned into book one. Um, so at this point, I was sort of a, you know, a made man, if you like, in, with, with a background in philosophy and, and psychoanalysis. So that will be the uh, initial, initial entry into psychoanalysis. And from there, uh, I went away and sort of wrote a second book, basically, um, from, so went from Nietzsche and Lacan to Bataille and Lacan. And that's the book that we uh, have before us today and that we are going to be discussing for your uh, regular and wonderful viewers today. Yeah, that's a writer saving aesthetics in the real with Bataille and Lacan. Let me hold it up for you. Yeah, you exactly. Go. Fantastic. Nice and shiny. And you're in a, an event coming up this week on the 8th with the Lacan Circle. I, I do. Sunday week, it will be a conversation with uh, myself and, and Russell, my old supervisor, who is currently the president of the Lacan Circle of Australia. Um, and we're going we're gonna to have an interview for 45 minutes and then we're going to throw open to, to, the, to the room, which today is the Zoom. I think there's already uh, over 100 people uh, registered to come. So I'm registered. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So try and sneak your questions in and um, we'll try and answer and you know, make it make it a convivial uh, event uh, for all who uh, participate. And those who can't participate at that time, by registering, you do get access to the recording. So um, that should be a, a bit of fun. Yeah, and the look, we should look, plug the Lacan Circle in general while we're at it because you have great reading groups going on and events going on all the time and it's open to everybody. You don't have to have any prior knowledge of psychoanalysis and philosophy to make it really accessible. Um, and that's really something to mention. And also the Twitter and Instagram are hilarious. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, uh, our secretary, Eugenie, uh, she has a very uh, savvy eye for the social media. She, can, she also says, no, join us on social media if you can bear it. And if you can bear it, it's a good one to bear because she's uh, pretty, pretty witty, pretty sassy, and she's really committed to uh, uh, kind of promoting the Lacan Circle's activities and Lacan's thought. And um, yeah, it makes it very accessible for people starting off the first time. We've got a range of seminars uh, being taught in semester two as well, including one by myself, which will be on the uh, thorny topic of perversion, uh, oh. which uh, Russell thought it would be a nice segue, like you've written a book on Bataille and eroticism. Let's let's now do a seminar on Lacan and perversion, and so that's um, 
a kind of transitional project when you finish one project and you're like, you know, of course you've got to like, you know, copy edit it, promote it, do everything, but, but, but then what, you know, you sort of start thinking about uh, what's next and, uh, you know, teaching is usually a good thing to do, but teaching that somehow points towards maybe the next Another book. project. <laughs> yeah. The third book. Yeah. <laughs> Stuck writing books forever, you know, but um, That's it's a uh, pretty challenging. <laughs> it's a life. Yeah. Very challenging, but um, very rewarding when uh, things come to fruition. Yeah, so let's talk about your new book a little bit. Um, what would you like to say about it? How did you get the idea for it? How did I get the idea for it? Well, when it came to writing my my PhD on Lacan and Nietzsche, it originally started off with philosophy and psychoanalysis. And then, because, you know, when you're doing a PhD in a bureaucratic academic setting, they're always wanting you to narrow the focus, narrow the focus, because it's your first it's your first PhD, it's your first book. And so it ended up stripping off all these other figures and it just became Lacan and Nietzsche on the topic of ethics. And so after that, it was about, well, what were some of the parts that got jettisoned uh, for that first project that I still, you know, feel passionate about and feel a, a very valuable? And that was uh, this book that Bataille wrote uh, towards the end of his Uber um, in 1957 called Eroticism. Uh, I was just uh, you know, gobsmacked, sorry for the slang, but when I first read that book, I was astounded by it. I actually bought it, bought it in Paris from one of the, that, that English bookshop on the, um, on the River Seine next to the Notre Dame. Mm. Yeah, probably everyone's been there. But um, and I was just reading it in cafes going, Whoa, like, I'd never read anything like it before. And so I really wanted to see how I could work that into the, uh, what I'd already sort of written about and, you know, Bataille had all these sort of uh, subtle connections with Lacan as well. Um, the, the most you know, famous one being uh, Sylvia Bataille. Sylvia Bataille was uh, Bataille's first wife. And then at some point she was Lacan's second wife. But things being as they were with the uh, legal situation, she kept the name Bataille. Uh, and so the daughter she had with uh, Lacan, Judith, also kept the name Bataille. And there was also the daughter that Sylvia had with Bataille himself, who was there living with them. So it was Judith and Sylvia Bataille with Sylvia Bataille and Lacan. And they were a kind of, uh, you know, family unit for uh, all those decades in uh, Lacan's most productive um, periods. And um, in terms of the content, I think the notion of the real and the notion of jouissance and enjoyment beyond normal limits, beyond the pleasure principle, uh, I think really like had some interesting parallels, which is not all uh, not all arbitrary because they have shared intellectual sources like the French School of Sociology, uh, Freud, Bataille loved Freud's uh, group psychology works, and Bataille himself was psychoanalyzed. He, he said it saved his life. Uh, his friends were worried about his life, and if you read some of his bio, you could understand why. And so he really thought psychoanalysis made his made him viable enough to work. And that was um, the result of that early psychoanalysis was the uh, famous uh, surrealist erotic novella, The Story of the Eye, probably the most recognisable bit of erotic fiction uh, yeah, there is amongst us uh, bookish types. Yeah. Absolutely. I also love his book on eroticism. So I love that that's kind of what sparked this. Um, and I haven't read his biography. Tell me more. It's, it's pretty wild. Um, well, if you if you read Story of the Eye, have you had a look at Story of the Eye before? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, at the end, there's he gives you know some of his analysis with Adrian Borel, who was one of the founders of um, uh, the Freud affiliated uh, Parisian Psychoanalytic Society, like the IPA of, of Paris, basically, who loved working with artists, and so that's why his friends said work with Borel. I think I've even seen him playing a priest in a film, if I'm not mistaken, a black and white, black and white film. Um, yeah. But so he gives some of his, his bio at the end of it, which is some of his initial sort of uh, primal scene, the, the famous one where he sees, he used to see his syphilitic blind father uh, 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 peeing into like a bowl or whatever he used to use to pee because he was an invalid in a chair. And the, and the young Bataille used to watch and sort of, enjoy the spectacle of like 
father's fellas comes out, you know, in a bowl, he can't see me, I can see him. And it was like a kind of, uh, you know, at the, at the origin of all these obsessions he kept having about this sort of wandering metaphor of an eye, which is then an egg, which is then a, a, a testicle, which is then the sun. And, um, and all the liquids that normally come out um, start changing as well where they, and, and interchanging. So um, if, a, if you know, an eye usually cries tears, but if the eye is an egg, then it may release yolk. But then you can have mix the fluids up too. So then you've got the egg crying and the eye releasing yolk. Or, uh, and so all these sort of crisscrossing in language is happening. While you know a transgression of the of the normal relations of language are happening, while the erotic transgression of values is happening too, and the development of this narrative, and because of the sort of formal intricacy of of the eroticism, a structuralist linguistic uh, linguists like Roland Barthes just you know wrote a famous essay on this book, which is um, one of the ones that I was you know, curious about too, and and uh, and also came to discuss. What was the question? Bataille's biography. That's right. Yeah. It. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it, it was pretty wild. Then, then there's this, this later scenes that he recollects where he's sort of uh, having to abandon his dad when the Nazis came because they lived in a small rural uh, village. Mm. Uh, when they went back one day, all they found was a coffin. And then sort of some episodes about his mother's madness. Uh, um, uh, and also their relation, it, it sounded really tumultuous. So there was definitely some, you know, a lot of traumatic episodes in his life, which he was able to channel into uh, his intellectual productivity, and in, in, uh, which the, including into his analysis, which helped uh, him sort of perform that task. But he, he could be quite wild in his life. Like he was uh, into Russian roulette and getting trunk of brothels, and it's the Russian and the and the heavy gambling, like load up everything on black or everything on red or whatever he was playing, and that's why when the friends sort of intervened to sort of say, uh, you know, there's things that could help you with this, yeah, and it just ha helped him stabilize it, but but still he was you know had a penchant for uh, swinging and and orgies and starting religions, secret cults. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and um, World War II was more of a meditating, a meditative sort of period in his life, introspection. Um, but he, he came out of it, um, and the, the stuff after the war is probably my favourite stuff of his. I really like the early stuff and the late stuff. The stuff after the war was really mature and scholarly, as you'd expect for somebody who's been through a lot and has survived multiple decades. They, they start you know, finding, finding a balance, uh, reflecting on everything that they've... Uh, learnt, experienced, and um, yeah, and that's when I think you get some really uh, mature, sober, valuable scholarship that's of, uh, of value to people who aren't interested in just, you know, amazing biographies, but actually <laughs> interested in the content of the, of the work and the, and the conceptual development and how we can solve problems, big problems that, you know, we come to and shock us when we're young and make us wonder what, what it's all about. What are people doing? Why is the world like this? What, what should we do to fix it? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really getting more and more into reading about people's life histories and stuff because I feel so much like theorists that we read, you know, of course they're all in a context, but that never really comes across um, when theories are being taught. Like they're never really taught, it feels like in the historical time that they were happening in and I feel like when you start learning more about the person and their life and yeah. um, the time that they were working in it all makes much more sense and like becomes much richer and I feel like we should integrate that more and more into into the work when we're teaching theory yeah especially when we're interested in psychoanalysis too because uh, when people do go on to achieve great things in the arts and in philosophy um it's interesting to see how they were able to sublimate some of their, uh, you know, some of their passions, some of their destructive passions, based on shocks and traumas that they had in their in their early life, and um, that's ultimately, I think, very encouraging for you know, for, for any subject it comes along today and is wondering how to deploy their energy. Yeah. Will you talk about the real more in the title of your book? 
Yeah, so it started off with a kind of, uh, with the ethics of psychoanalysis, which is Lacan's 7R7, right? Uh, and the ethics of psychoanalysis is, it was, it was phrased as an ethics of desire, but what is desire in Lacan? It's a configuration of the drives, the polymorphous perversity of the drives, which are uh, a key part of what is the real, because the real is defined as that which we are normally not able to assimilate um, into our conscious part of our minds, into our egos, uh, because it's too traumatic to consider, um, too perverse. We generally don't like to see ourselves as having oral and anal kind of fetishes and fixations or drives, uh, having a, you know, a sadomasochistic maybe a, a component to our sexuality. It's, you know, we, we generally you know, like to see ourselves as, I'm generalising, of course, that's what I'm saying generally, uh, enlightenment, you know, self-sufficient, self-certain subjects who are masters of our own house, we know ourselves and we define ourselves as this and that and it's all pretty much on the surface. Uh, we, design it, we define ourselves as being uh, connected to the good. We are part of society, of civil good. Okay, but then we look at what's going on in society and civilization again, it's bad. So, what's happening? What's happening is that this polymorphous perversity that we're not avowing acts out anyway. Yeah, and so the ethics of psychoanalysis is different to morality or moralism. And it says uh, first, reflect inwards. Uh, Look at what Freud, Freud discovered, the polymorphous perversity of the drives, which aren't just oral, anal, like monophetic rays. They are, uh, you know, they are memorialized drives. They are connected to your intimate personal histories and, uh, and they transfer across various landmarks of your lives. So, for example, there was Bataille with the image of his father urinating, a sickly father urinating in his bowl at night and him watching, seeing dad naked do that. You imagine how that affects a kid who's you know, four or five. Um, and then later it was his mother going mad and, and, and you know, the violence between them and he thought he might have to, like, kill her to stay alive, to, to save his own life, and then finding her trying to hang herself in a river. Mm. You know, the, the, those images and how they kind of then roll onto all his experiences with, um, with, uh, with male and female sort of subjects in the rest of his life and how this ends up in his... Um, Work because he reflect he reflects on it. He sublimates. He reflects on it. He knows he knows the roots of it. But for the people who don't, what happens? It's like you subconsciously remind me of somebody who hurt me in the past. Kill, or you, or you, or we're very easily manipulated in, in that way too. You know, kind of what Jung calls shadow shadow projection, to use the Jungian term, or uh, you know, negative transferences where we carry across things from the past into the present, even though they're not exactly the same. Um, and so that's why the ethics of psychoanalysis as an ethics of the real is supposed to get us turning in towards the real a little bit more. Um, personally, as subjects, also politically, when we look at, um, we, we might like to see ourselves say, I'm coming right now from uh, Melbourne, Australia. What a wonderful uh, place that is. But what's beneath the bar is that, well, I'm not part of the original uh, inhabitants of the land. That's the First Nations people. What happened to them? It wasn't a, wasn't a very nice story. That, that hasn't been properly redressed. And what about all the people that came here fleeing from various uh, forms of tyranny, often capitalist tyranny in various parts of the world, or uh, tyrannies that were set up by the elites in you know, the richer parts of the Western world? Uh, these are pretty horrible stories too. And, and the, the treatment of the book, see, we, first we say Australia, Melbourne, it's all good. And then we look beneath the bar. That's the political real. And that's connected to the individual, the ethical real too. And the fact that we continue to uh, supply and fund and support these nihilistic processes um, almost, almost blindly, almost as if somehow we're still doing the, the right thing. So that's, so that's the ethics of the real. And then... By going from there into Bataille, I wanted to look at the, the erotics of the real. I wanted to see how whether eroticism can somehow uh, support this ethics in some way um, by looking at the going all the way back and looking at the transition from from animal to human, uh, which for Bataille with his anthropological uh, influences was performed by installing taboos on sex and death, and it, it all comes down to how how those taboos are installed which in psychoanalytic terms might be uh, primary repression. Um, if they're not sort of installed in a way that's suitably porous, 
allow sublimated outlets, then they're going to have destructive uh, outlets. And um, and uh, yeah, and by bringing in eroticism, though, I wanted to sort of, I guess, uh, open up the idea that there, there there is natural motivation for us to get into this into the real rather than shy it away. We have a natural motivation in that it's an erotic thing to reaccess our repressed polymorphous perversity. Um, if this can be done in a in a guided and uh, and controlled way. Yeah, and the, and the standard outlet uh, used to be religion, uh, prehistoric religion, uh, archaic religion, uh, where animality was always part of the divinities. Um, yeah, animality deeply stamps the gods, as Bataille became really interested in uh, uh, sort of the history of religion. Uh, just as Nietzsche was always interested in the in the Hellenic divinities, as opposed to the what Socrates and Plato did, which was to introduce what uh, what Bataille calls dualism, where the divine becomes connected to a pure spirit, and the rest becomes relegated to to evil, which is matter, body, all animality. That's all fallen from the divine, and sort of late Judaism and Christianity moves in and sort of grafts itself onto that. And now we've got a completely different structure for religion, where it's not really an outlet, the Abrahamic religions that we have today, or Platonic philosophy for this um, divine animality, if you like. Some of it goes into the arts, right? And this is where we move from, from erotics, from ethics to erotics to aesthetics. Um, yeah, because the art, in a sense, there's a sense where religion is art. We create things. We create things out of our drives, right? And uh, we, we, that can be a sort of a, a way to sublimate the real and get a sort of aesthetic outlet, uh, an erotic outlet, uh, one that can be done and framed within an ethics. So um, just tracking Bataille's Uber, I was sort of looking at his sort of creative works, his novel Story of the Eye, um, his confrontation with Bataille surrealism, great, a great little dispute, that one as well. Um, it's interesting in Paleolithic art, cave paintings of animals, divine animals. Um, and then his own novels, like his own writings on literature, reviewing other people's works. In, um, in the journal critique that he edited after after the war, the mature scholarly Bataille. And, and I finished off with one of his uh, political novels, erotic political novels, which I can't believe uh, no one made it into a noir thriller like back in back in the day. But he didn't actually, uh, he wrote it in the 30s, but it wasn't published until the late 50s because his friends made him. And that's uh, Blue of Noon, um, which uh, you may or may not have heard of. Uh, I haven't Blue of Noon. read it. No, I want to hear more about that. Yeah, it's a it's a really good one. So uh, it's the the setting is basically the the Spanish Civil War. Um, one of the characters is loosely based on the on the on the Christian socialist Simone Vale. Uh, the other one is loosely based on um, his partner at the time, uh, whose name was uh, Laura who also was a, was a writer, uh, who, who, her real name was Colette Pignot, um, but she went under Laura, and so she's the character loosely modelled on, um, called Dirty in, in this novel, Blue of Noon, who's a very debauched, so de very debauched figure, so debauched that she frightens the protagonist of the novel, a male protagonist who's you know, probably a dead ringer for, for Bataille or, or some fictionalisation of himself. His name is Trotman. Um, until Trotman becomes impotent. So, like, I actually brought in uh, Freud's uh, paper on um, what's it, the tendency to debasement in the sphere of love, isn't it, when he talks about male impotence to sort of uh, analyse, like, what's going on with his, with his figure's impotence um, and why is he so afraid of this uh, debauched feminine uh, uh, sort of figure he's in love with, dirty, so afraid that he can, now, he can no longer function um, with his erection. And I think one of the one of the differences is like uh, uh, dirty. Uh, the Blue of Noon is set in real life in, in the Spanish Civil War, whereas Story of the Eye, back at the start, is is, is a surrealist fantasy. So it's not really, uh, you know, there's, there's one of the things to like have, have this have an app. There's a difference between fantasy and reality, right? In all eroticism, in all pornography, in all uh, in all sort of desire, which is a very important distinction. And so some of the things that we may fantasize about. And enjoy as an outlet in real life and scare the crap out of us. So there's there's something like that going on, I think, in Blue of Noon. And 
Matthias' character himself connects it to, he thinks he's a necrophiliac. He thinks he's like obsessed with death and that, that's somehow uh, affecting his, um, his performance. That's why Dirty left him. That's why he's depressed. That's why he's hanging out with his figure called Lazar, modeled on Simone Vale. Uh, who are, and and the two of them are trying to plot some kind of uh, uh, assistance to the Spanish uh, um, to the Spanish um, revolution. Uh, they've gone to Barcelona to help the workers, uh, while of course Nazism was on the rise and uh, and eventually did take over Spain, didn't it? And of course, later on in uh, in Germany and much of Europe for a while. And it hasn't really gone completely away, has it? Because we've seen a sort of twenty first century return of fascism, uh, it sits there in the margins and when the corruption of the bourgeois uh, gets too much, people are either going to go uh, to the left or they're going to go to the right and fascists are waiting there on the right and so we always have to be careful about what, what are the causes um, of them. And for Bataan, I think what comes out in Blue of Moon is, of course, it's the economic situation. If we squeeze the ordinary working class um, put austerity on them, uh, they're going to go mad. When they go mad, they're going to go to one side or the other. You know, we've had this huge, like, war on communism in the West right, for so many years that it's just completely foreclosed that anyone will look at socialism or communism. All they've got is further to the right, right? So you vote for Trump or you start waving your, your, your flag and, uh, you know, getting funny haircuts and doing all sorts of things. Uh, not us personally, but this is what, what happens a lot of the time. But then there's also the sort of um, the kind of moralism, the unpsychoanalytic moralism that goes on with the establishment left too, thinking, well, we can't really challenge the bourgeois because they control everything. So why don't we try to like be you know, super politically correct and, um, and, and, and con people that these are the really big issues. We'll graft ourselves onto authentic issues concerning you know, gender, sexuality, LGBT, which of course are very important issues. But let's like use them and distort them so that you know we don't actually have to do what the left should be doing, which is getting rid of the like uh, the bourgeois elite who corrupt and putting austerity on the, the masses of people. So in the centre, we've got a kind of right, an establishment right, and establishment left that's failing, and people either go to the genuine left, say so like uh, we have like groups like DM25, which is um, uh, founded by people like Yanis Varoufakis from Greece endorsed by people like uh, Slavoj Žižek and Noam Chomsky in the intellectual world, uh, left-wing politicians like Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn in the, you know, who are on the left of the establishment left, if you like, marginalised within their own parties, but trying to do something from there. Um, yeah. They either go there or they go to the far right. They go to Trump and beyond, which is happening, uh, uh, you know, all throughout the West. And um, I think this book sheds real light on, on the sort of psychoanalytic complexities that are going on um, uh, in this sort of like movement. And Bataille's later work on the accursed chair, uh, which is basically an economic street, it's, um, which has a whole volume within it on the history of eroticism, which is the early version of the book eroticism that you've uh, read. Um, yeah, so accursed chair. So volume one's on consumption, volume two is on history of eroticism. That became an abridged, an abridged version of that became eroticism 10 years later in 1957. Then there's a volume three on sovereignty. And so I had a look at those sort of uh, three, three books and used them to kind of analyze what's going on in, in Blue of Noon as a sort of metaf key metaphor. And then use that to sort of reflect on the problem we have today of the rise of fascism, the rise of the, of the far right and the failure of the establishment left to stop the corruption of the establishment right. And um, which is uh, yeah, still an issue, I guess, today, with, especially with COVID times. Whew, who knows what's in store for us? It's, uh, it's, it's going to be a hell of a ride. Well, that's why I love asking people kind of their own journey, because I didn't know, for example, that you were an engineer before. And then talking about, you know, how that experience informed your work and, you know, working for corporations where your job is supposed to be like actually to help the planet, but instead it's to kind of cover up what's happening to it. Um, and then tying that into your work now and talking about the, the political real and like the traumas that are ignored throughout history, which all seem to be hopefully like coming more to the surface more and more now and getting addressed more, which may, you know, like you said, also uh, 
contribute to this kind of split. Like some people are really trying to address it. And then some people are being very defensive and trying to like uh, deny it again and, and become fascist. Yeah. And it sort of raises the question of uh, what, 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 what are people searching for when they go to fascism? Like they're searching for more economic resources. What, what makes them go to the far right instead of the far, far left? And what Blue of Noon like, enables one, one to sort of uh, speculate is that they're looking for a version of the drive, the raw primordial drive. And fascism is a kind of uh, twisted parody of almost laughable parody from a scientific perspective of the drive. But for a, for a repressed, uneducated uh, person, that's good enough. They might half know, but they still, at least it's, there's some kind of promise of sovereignty there that appeals to them at, at a base level, which sometimes doesn't happen on the left if, if they are not open to the psychoanalytic reel, for example, the polymorphous perversity of the drives, eroticism, aesthetics, if they're just a sort of hard-nosed uh, kind of moralist or economist, um, which is sort of like the Lazar character in Blue of the Moon is secretly channeling the Puritan psychology of Christianity and, and applying it to left-wing sort of praxis. Um, it, it doesn't seem to, to grip the, the populace as a whole. Um, and I think that's what the, the, the Blue of the Moon uh, novel enables one to see in uh, Trotman's revulsion with Lazar. He's sort of sitting there and he's just sort of like just, he just can't help but feel like Lazar is like death on death on legs and like, he starts telling telling her about his perverse stories just to shock her, and uh, he almost starts reacting uh, in the opposite way as you'd expect the sort of uh, the kind of left wing activist to uh, to to act. Um, they're looking for a for a version of the job. Like I remember when Trump came first came out and he had those uh, American uh, white American blonde girls doing the like the twirling and like uh, like, like like it was a Mickey Mouse thing. I'm just going oh. It's uh, on one hand stupid, right? On the other hand, oh yeah, that's that, that's what fascism is. It's stupid, but you can see how it impinges on the drive and might act as a lure for people in the wrong direction. And this is what had had Blue of Noon the novel ends. It, it ends with uh, Trotman at the station observing a Nazi marching band, all the pretty blonde uh, boys and girls doing the sort of left, right, and then the drumming. And he just started seeing them as grotesque monkeys, like seeing the, um, the, the stick going up and down like that, seeing as like he, like he was jerking off this gigantic monkey penis or something. And he just started like debunking it all into, into the perversity that it was to sort of uh, unseat the kind of the pure kind of uh, image that they were creating of themselves, which was conning people into the belief of the purity of race, you know, uh, the backwards nationalistic forms of violence as, as, uh, as Bataille calls it. So he, he raised the question through many parts of his life that, um, you know, what can we do about the rise of fascism given the insufficiency of communism? What can we do to, to, to stop that? And his work, the novel Blue of Noon, which in the, in the 30s period coincided with his work with the College of Sociology and um, the Secret Society of Asifal. Um, a lot of the early meetings of these societies were also held in Lacan's apartment which is where Lacan uh, you know, did the robbery, if you like. It wasn't really a robbery, where he, he met Sylvia and sort of uh, uh, ran off with her and they became a, an item. Um, but, yeah, there were fantastic figures that used to turn up to that, like Roger Kawar, uh, Michael Lurie. Uh, I think Walter Benjamin uh, would, would turn up uh, occasionally. Um, who were the other ones? Uh, Klosowski, uh, Kozhev, uh and, um, and before that, Bataille was involved in a, in a group called the Democratic Communist Circle, and that's where he first met uh, Laura, um, who at the time was the partner of Boris Suvaran, who founded the circle, who was, I think, himself a, a, a refugee, a Trotsky, a ref, Trotskyist refugee from Russia. And they were there trying to form a communist uh, group and a journal, La Critique Sociale, where they were trying to exceed on Marxism by using some of the uh, influences that we have, for example, from French sociology, psychoanalysis and, and German philosophy. And I would say, what, what can we do to augment uh, Marx's practice? What can we do to sort of uh, make it deeper, make it more robust, make, make its influences 
more secure um, so that it's not a kind of narrow, insufficient regurgitating of uh, a Sermon on the Mount or, uh, or some kind of a Christian structure based on what Lacan in Seminar 17, I think, very rightly calls Yahweh's ferocious ignorance about sexual knowledge and Yahweh's ferocious ignorance about uh, uh, religious practices that blend sexual knowledge with nature itself. Um, yeah, which was was part of the thing, the Festival of Dionysus. The artists turn up, uh, all the, f- the feminine divinities, for example, all the feminine deities uh, disappear, don't they, in the whole Ab- Abrahamic tradition? But um they're very important. I think it's very important to have these metaphors for femininity as well um, and for feminine animality. Um, but that all just got you know, consumed in the fires and um, yeah, some of it reappears in the arts and um, it's you know, maybe something that we could try to uh, uh, incorporate more. Um, yeah. Yeah, the car, I love that you talked about that and like the early religions being also like a form of art because Carl and I talk about that all the time. Like Carl always says that, you know, that that's real, like true art is what people were doing, like working with nature, working with their bodies, working with sexuality and music and fire and, you know, like creating these kinds of performances, but they sublimate and they have a real function that really gets lost when it just becomes like an intellectual exercise, both in religion and in art. <laughs> New art is very much like an intellectual exercise. Yeah, and that's that's where the the notion of transgression is, I think, very important for Bataille and Lacan, Um, because what what religion used to mean was sacred time, no longer profane time, which is governed by taboos, um, so you could work and accumulate your reserves. Religion, the festival, is about sacred time. You can transgress those normal taboos in, in a guided way. That's not anything goes, but in a guided way, you transgress your normal taboos, which enables you to go back to animality in some way, which isn't the same as what it was beforehand. Like when we return to animality after taboos, it becomes magnified in the imaginary to something divine. And that's when you get all those like wonderful practices that that you were talking about that were part of uh, culture for so long before Christianity and Platonism and late Judaism put this dualistic sort of structure where the only transgression you get now when you go to religion, a church is... The, the poor guy on the cross, right, which, which, which is seen as a sort of paradoxical happy error. Um, but you're not really getting to uh, access your animality in any way. When you look at that, you're supposed to, like, feel responsible and confess that you have animality, which is a sin and a crime. You killed the most beautiful, pure, you know, figure in the world. Shame on you, you know, have, get that out of your system and then go back to work where you're killing and raping and pillaging anyway. Like, so... It's the sort of like uh, the the violence or has been sort of displaced, and this is why Bataille calls it the accursed share. I think the French is le, le part uh, multi, the, the the accursed part, um, and it's the part that we share with other other animals. It becomes accursed because we don't really acknowledge it and deify it, um, you know, so in in any way. You can say like you can you can look at capitalism and say it's so hedonistic today. It's perverse. They're doing it all the time. Everything's pornography and um, sexualization. But the issue there is that it's nothing to do with the sacred. <laughs> it's to do with blind hedonism. It's 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 not a sacred. Uh, it's not a sacred venture. It's not seen as something divine. It's seen as something illicit or perverted or greedy or lustful uh, or something to make a buck out of, something to exploit each other out of. But you know, within those pockets within those niches you know one still can find like good cultural moments to to try and seize on and um and have that sacred sacred moment which can remind us of that earlier archaic heritage that you know, something of which perhaps we can reclaim yeah it's what, what you see is very surface there's not all this depth to it a lot of the time now i also like describing the these rituals and this religious rites as these kinds of like contained scenes and it reminds me of like BDSM scenes where like you enter into it like we're going to take this space and time and have this act and enact this thing and then you step out of it back into usual life. Mm. Yeah there's a the scenes can be quite interesting in uh, uh, swinging spaces as well like insofar as 
they're able to open up in certain um, niche places in um, you know in the more cosmopolitan uh, centers. But uh, but there's also a limit too, and I, I guess that's that's why you know, from the Lacanian perspective, people are like, oh, perversion. Are you talking about perversion? You know, so I, I'm sort of looking at the, the seminar on perversion and Freud's uh, writings on perversions, and uh, where, where I think I'm going to use this sort of background in Bataille and Nietzsche is to say, okay, some of these these descriptions, these interpretations that Freud first uncovers and the psychoanalysis uncovers of uh, these sort of polymorphously perverse acts, it's not that they're, they're not there, the Oedipus stuff, the phallic stuff, you know, castration complex. It's not that they're not there. It's it's that we're, we're describing them. We're not prescribing them. Like we're, we're describing these structures so that we can uncover the primary repressed material beneath uh, beneath the bar and make them reavailable for sublimation. Give us more control over them. Give us more knowledge over them. Give us more experience with them. And, uh, and, and it deepens it. So it's not just that blind compulsive hedonism, which can lead to addiction, which can lead to um, criminality in some cases. Um, but also, it can also just lead to, you know, blind, banal, uh, repetitive an animality, like a dumb animal that doesn't really, that's not, not really kind of uh, cherished in any way, something to buy. So, yeah, but those spaces are very interesting indeed. And uh, one has to come from a, one has to be lucky to come from a place where that's possible, I guess. Um, which uh, not everybody the world over, I guess, would have. Um, and even if they do know of those places, they might not be any, any of any sustainable quality or they um, might have too many resistances to even go there in the first place. So when is um, your course? Thinking... Sorry? When is oh, your the, course? This, the perversion one? That mm -hmm. is starting uh, 17th of August. Oh, it's coming up soon. Yeah, so that's a 10 weeker. It's going to be uh, Tuesday um, Tuesday evenings uh, about this time, uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time, seven o'clock. So, which in Stockholm time is about what, 10, about 10 o'clock in the morning now, is it? Yeah, yeah. it's 11. 11, okay, which, which is for all of Europe, isn't it? That's, mm -hmm. they're, about the, they're about the same. Um, I'm not sure what it would be in this in this in the North America. It tends to be really, really super early. Then for them, it would be it? early, but for people in the UK or EU. That's know. right. Yeah, because we had we had that yeah that three way uh, time zone to organise for the um, cast off event that's coming up. Uh, that's, that's October ninth. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be fun uh, too. Do you know much? Have you looked into that much? Like I'm, I'm sort of waiting to I you know I've got a lot of lots lot of stuff right now for me, but um. I'm sort of looking forward to getting into the, the people involved in that um, as the time comes closer. Have you looked into it much yourself? Yeah, exactly. It's, well, it's you and me and Marcus Boone and David Bart Schwartz there in North America. And it's hosted by Frank Ansel, who's in Paris. So we have this like continental divide we have of all of us. Um, and so you're going to be speaking really late. And for them in North America, it's going to be really early. For me, it's like 2 p.m., because um, I'm right in the middle, so it's easy for me. <laughs> um, but I think we're which, just which all aspect? presenting our work on psychoanalysis and different different arts, um, and then discussing it. So this should be really fun. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, Mark, geez, I, I come, living in New York, like I, growing up in Australia, I've watched so many films based in that whole New England area. Like that must have been a hell of an experience. It must have been so interesting. There's so many different cultures in there as well, like the Irish, the Italian, the Jewish. Um, Anyone and you can think of is there. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is there. No, it's really lovely in that way. Um, I'm from Miami originally. So I, oh, right. I kind of, I've like, every move I've made has been like adjust, letting me adjust a little bit more and more to the next phase. So coming from Miami, of course, is very hot and tropical and, everybody's from the Caribbean and South America and um, it's very multicultural in that sense and that was lovely and then I lived in California for my postdoc year but in northern California like north of San Francisco so that way the weather was like cooler um, but it was very it was at a college thankfully at a university so it had a lot of different people in that regard but the town itself was like uh, it was in the redwood forest so it was very different than coming from a big city um, and then I lived in New York for nine years, um, which was fantastic. And I lived all around. I lived in Brooklyn, different parts of Brooklyn and Queens and 
I lived in the East Village for a little bit. Um, and sadly, the East Village, that was like my really dream goal was like, you know, all the artists of the East Village and to be able to be there and they're kind of path but like it's so different now it's like it's just like I guess the thing is like a big mall you know <laughs> it's like uh, Manhattan's like a big mall it's like very gentrified and everything uh yeah it's just like corporate everything's corporate all the mom and pop places have had to close uh over the years because the rent is just so insanely expensive that they can't stay open so there's actually a psychoanalyst named Griff Hansberry in New York, who um, is also has an alter ego of Jeremiah. And he made a column called Jeremiah's Vanishing New York. And I think he moved there like around the same time that I did, like 2008, and started this column. So I used to follow it, not knowing he was an also a psychoanalyst. <laughs> I used to follow his column. Uh, where he would write b blogs about like the different places that were closing because literally you'd go to go somewhere like two weeks after you'd been there and it would just be gone it's like you, you, there was like no permanence it felt like in New York like every time you try to go back to something you've done before it like well, didn't exist anymore it was really odd um, and so yeah I think then he ended up finally making a book called Jeremiah's Vanishing New York and uh and then came out as a psychoanalyst. <laughs> like, I was a psychoanalyst, what? which I thought was so fun. Because I knew Griff, the psychoanalyst, and I knew Jeremiah, but he did not know they were the same person. <laughs> did, did you know that, uh, that Noam Chomsky's first intellectual influence was a self-taught Freudian psychoanalyst? I did not. Yeah, I think he he was he was a uh, he had a I think a hunchback, a disability. So he was on a pension, but he ran one of the newsstands at the back of the major train station there. And uh, and so Noam used to go down and visit his his maternal uncle, and behind the newsstand, all these intellectual sort of street people would like, or refugee people, immigrant people, New York people would just sit there and talk about nothing but philosophy and politics. And that was actually his uh, his early uh, you know formative education, his sort of like street education that he talks about. Um, but his uncle went on to become open up a clinic as a self taught uh, Freudian. Yeah, while Noam himself, he turned away from psychoanalysis. I, I used to correspond uh, with him and I got him to talk about it a little bit. And uh, he turned away from psychoanalysis. But I think sometimes, he, you know, he has the ability to, to be really rational. And um, I think this, I sometimes see there's some psychoanalytic uh, kind of uh, thinking in the way he's able to not get caught up in, in illusions and sort of stay with the recognition of the real and the political real in, in his case. Um, but yeah, like I, I would still like to sort of compliment what uh, you know great logical positive figures like that do on the left with the psychoanalytic knowledge that uh, that we can bring through you know great figures like Freud and Lacan and uh, cognate philosophers like uh, uh, Nietzsche and Bataille because um, yeah, I, I, I think not you know it's not all about economics as we, as we know it's it's also about the drive giving people access some kind of outlet, erotic outlet for the drive and uh, some kind of mechanism of self-reflection, which is not about, you know, confession and renunciation, but acknowledging that there is, there is some sacred in there, something that used to be called the sacred and be the stuff for religions. And um, yeah, I want to help the left. <laughs> yeah, no, I yeah. think it's a really important point. It's not all just an intellectual exercise, you know, yeah. It was like, uh, like I had a recent guest who wrote the book, who was also from Mel more Melbourne, actually, uh, Nathan Bell, and, and teaches at the University of Melbourne. And he wrote a book on refugees uh, and an ethics towards responsibility. And his point of view was that basically the center of politics needs to become, um, you know, focusing on taking in refugees and people who are seeking asylum as a priority um, but it's the, the, the intellectual exercise of that and like that's the right thing to do intellectually, you know, misses this whole like, like we were talking about, I think before recording, it's like more like groupthink psychology is like when people feel defensive or people need outlets for their drives. And, and even also with communism, like, you know, it's a really nice idea for everyone to be equal and have a classless society, but there always has to be something organizing that. So then you automatically have a hierarchy built in. There's no way for people just to organize themselves at the foul, you know, like really headless. How would that work? And as soon as you have something organizing it, then you have this hierarchy. 
And also, of course, how do you get rid of a uh, hierarchy when people are born into families with parents and siblings, like there's sibling rivalry, there's you know, rivalry with the parents and ambivalence and, and love towards the parents. So it's like all inbuilt into humans. How do you undo all of that with an intellectual exercise of that? We want to treat everyone the same and welcome everybody so that everybody's safe, you know? Like there's a lot to contend with under the surface. Like it sounds nice on the surface, but like there's all these strives and identifications and hierarchies happening that we're born into. So you can't just like undo, undo that. You have to somehow figure out a way to work with that to get the kind of result that you want of people having more equitable society. Yeah, so I think Bataille's really interesting on this point, the cursed chair, because he says to have economic equality in the world will be a, a fantastic achievement, and I'm all for that. And But just remember, that's step one. Okay, we've all got economic security. Everyone, absolutely all the six, seven billion people across the whole globe, we have many years now, we've all got absolute economic equality. Now, what are we going to do with it? So we still need to sort of have that knowledge of the drives, which can connect it to our family, uh, sibling rivalries, our parents, uh, the child rearing. Um, we still we still got to like be aware of those so that we know what to do with this economic security if we ever get it. Um, and that's where Bataille has this idea that uh, eroticism can be very important. Yeah. And uh, making the that that uh, lifting the curse on that accursed chair, lifting the curse on that animal part of ourselves. And the reason why why he thinks that that communism did did fail was because it was never really tried in places where Marx wanted it to be tried, which were industrially advanced countries which already had a high productive capacity. Uh, it was only tried in countries where where the bourgeois had failed. They didn't go from feudalism to to capitalism then overthrew the bourgeois and went to communism. If Germany went to uh, communism, okay, they would have done that. Or if England did, or if America did, or if Australia did, all right. We had the bourgeois. We had an advanced bourgeois. We had an advanced industrial system. But Russia didn't. China didn't. So, um, but people like Lenin thought, well, we want to overthrow our, our feudal, feudal lords. Now our bourgeois is too weak. They, they can't really do anything. Um, we'll just start the revolution here. Germany and England will fall soon enough for then America, and then we'll have like a, you know, mass communism everywhere. But it didn't happen. So what has to happen in, in what happened in places like Russia and China is that primitive accumulation, where there's just pure asceticism, crude, reductive formulas, a, a brutal vanguard to keep everyone in line, to get them to produce, develop the technology, produce, 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 try and catch up to uh, to the richer countries in the West which uh, Marx would never have recommended because he, because he said all you would do there is replica, rep, replicate the cruelties that the English uh, elites inflicted on their working and rural classes in their period of primitive uh, accumulation, which is exactly what, what did happen and exactly sort of what happens today. Like I was talking about, you know, this new computer that the Lacan circles dropped off for me uh, to use for the upcoming events. But um you know, then there's the poor fox con, con workers behind it. You know, and it's it's, it's terrible. Like uh, I love the technology innovation, hate the whole circuits of labor, which means that people have to suffer and die in other parts of the world, and and the tax avoidance too that happens from these big tech companies. Um, that's money that could be used to like uh, further consciousness, um, political consciousness, and also ethical psychoanalytic consciousness, um, so that we can progress to a more you know. So communist friendly society. We have the industrial capacity and, and know-how in the advanced quest to do it. Um, if it doesn't work in poorer parts of the world, it's because they didn't. They were starting from so far behind and it's too easily corrupted. Um, it functions on a denial of the real, um, denial of eroticism. And then when do you ever get it back? When will I ever feel like now we can relax? The bourgeois or the war will never let them relax. They'll come in. As soon as the war falls down, they come in and take over and stick McDonald's up and, you know, and use the sort of cheap labour and uh, 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 turn into an extended capitalist uh, stronghold. Um, yeah. Yeah, when uh, Jeff Bezos yeah. went up in his rocket and then thanked all the Amazon workers and uh, and Amazon people who shop on Amazon, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh 
from New York. She, she said, why don't you just pay your taxes and then everyone can have health care? Exactly. Like that would be a way to thank everyone. <laughs> but yeah. really, like if they just paid their taxes, like just like everybody else is like pay your fair share of taxes. Like if everybody just across the board paid 30% of their salary, for example, in taxes, including corporations, you could have wonderful roads and health care and schools. I like, wouldn't that be nice? And wouldn't you want that like for your country and the world if you could provide that by just paying your taxes? Like how many billions of dollars do you need, you know? Um, Have we got an answer from him? No. Has it, no? <laughs> no, he specifically moves, he moves his Amazon places to yeah. places that won't make him pay, pay taxes. That's how he chooses like what site he's going to build, you know? Would it be too Freudian of me to say something really uh, unconsciously phallic in this uh, big phallic rocket flying That's up what into it space? Is. Yeah, <laughs> They're chasing the phallus, and the people who identify with with him too, rather than identifying with a a political movement that I could, you know, create that recircling of their cyclists. It's like, yeah, phallus, yeah, his success is my success. It's like, no, no, it's not. It's not. It's not yeah, he doesn't look after his workers. Um, uh yeah Don't but i also on the other side of that because people you know shit on him all the time fair but i also also keep in mind like but thank god he's not like a real like fascist person who like wanted to like take over the world and like implement like a really problematic society because with like the fact that he's like stationed everywhere and has access to everyone's houses through technology and these alexas and everything that could turn out really bad. So I'm just yeah. glad that he doesn't try to do that. But maybe he will. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a little bit like, um, you know, I, 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 like a lot of people, was relieved when Biden won instead of Trump. But, you know, that sort of mentality is still there beneath the bar. There's still the violence is just has a pretty face on it. Um it, it is. It's less severe, but it's it's still there. It, does, it doesn't. It doesn't change the fundamental. It doesn't change it's anything. Of capital. No, no. Um, Sanders would have done something different okay, if he got in. Yeah, he would have started the Green New Deal. He would have got uh, social spending on a yeah on like a thing society needs rather than printing money, giving it to the big banks who then give it to the big corporations who buy back their own shares and say. Look, that's a raise for me. Give me a bonus. It's um, one of the one of the things Barafaki so often uh, points out, and um, that's considered a good economy. That's considered, yep. There's no recession. Look at all this profit we're making. And it's like, uh, I'm, like I'm an expert on modern monetary theory, but I just feel like there could be a pop coming up. And then when there is, it's going to be, you know, the rich will bail themselves out. The poor will have austerity. Socialism for the rich, austerity for the poor. Just like in the history of uh, ethical discourse and morality, it's socialism for the ego, austerity for the id. It's like uh, all support for the rider, nothing for the horse. It's just being beaten to death and spat on as if it's this horrible beast. And, yeah, so there's a connection between that ethical uh, maladaption and the political maladaption. And that connection, we might say, is the real. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Tim Themey. For more, be sure to check out his books, Lacan's Ethics and Nietzsche's Critique of Platonism, and Eroticizing Aesthetics in the Real with Bataille and Lacan. And check out his upcoming events with the Lacan Circle of Australia. Sunday, August 8th is an event with Russell Grigg that's free and open to everyone. And then, starting on August 17th, Dr. Themi is hosting a seminar on perversion through the Lacan Circle of Australia, which runs once a week for 10 weeks. Visit their website, lacancircle.com.au, for information on these and many more events and happenings. They have study groups that are open, reading Lacan line by line, reading his seminars, that are also free and open to anyone interested in psychoanalysis. It's a really fantastic resource. So check them out. 
And then on October 9th, save the date, Dr. Themi and I will be part of an event called Cast Off, hosted by Frank Ansel in Paris. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. That's V-A-N-E-S-S-A 23 C-A-R-L. Your support is so appreciated. Thank you so much to all of our Patreon patrons. And now the song Occurring from my collaboration with Jillian Street and Damages called Future Moon, available digitally at Bandcamp and as a limited edition CD box set at Highbrow Low Life Tripart Editions. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. When you start on any journey, you should be equipped and to remind you to keep a calm, cool head while remaining family and is meant to keep negative spirits and energies or satisfied to finally leave. Behold, we know what you teach. All things recur eternally, and we ourselves with them, and that we have already existed an infinite number of times before and all things with us. Images presented here will be seen as they truly were, resplendent in the atrocity we once called life. The rope O would have, opposite her bed, the complete array of her instruments of torture. It was a handsome man, as art of, but then, why? Because the machine has become more than just a mere adjunct of life. It's really part of work. In dance, as in my occult, the ground up with breath through the feet. Preliminary up routine I practice. Thus speaks all great love. It overcomes even forgiveness and pity. A play of flowers, bel de jour. Dumbfounded, Jacqueline gazed at O. O burst out laughing and made as though to kiss her. Terror stricken, Jacqueline, they, she wondered, were they just going to? pushed her away and fled into her own room. O leisurely finished drying herself, put on her perfume and combed her hair. Place. Ivy didn't care anymore. She masturbated as loudly as she pleased. When she looked to thee are indicated in this script by footnotes and square brackets. 